Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be with you. You can be seated. Amen. Uh-oh. Uh, whew, catch my breath. I had to run there. Let's see my nose. Here we go. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here again. Thank you for letting me uh, speak to you once again. Uh, I don't know how many Sundays this is, three or four in a row, but uh, anyway, y'all, uh, Daddy's been adding a workload to me lately. But anyway, it's a great pl- uh, privilege and a great honor uh, to be standing here, so I don't take it lightly. I'm making noises somehow. There we go. I want to start with something funny for Brother Dennis. Uh I heard <laughs> heard a story about a guy that was out fishing on a boat, and he hear, heard this voice that said, pick me up. He's still fishing, and he heard the voice again. He thought he was going crazy, and sure enough, it said, pick me up. He looked around. The only person around the boat was a little frog, and sure enough, the frog was speaking, pick me up. This time it said, and kiss me, and I'll turn to a beautiful bride. The guy looked at the frog and said it again. Finally, the guy picked up the frog and stuck it in his shirt pocket. The frog said, wait a minute. I said, kiss me, and I'll turn to a beautiful bride. And the old man, being about 70 years old, said, frog, at my age, I'd just soon have a talking frog. (laughs) Uh, How many knows there are some instructions, some power in our words? Amen. Sister Michelle sung the uh, the song just now that we trust in Jesus. I believe that as we say that, Uh, The more we say things, our own ears hear it first. I believe it gets down in our spirit and our our minds begin to believe it. I wish that thing wasn't doing all that catching my breath. Uh, But today I want to share on the power of words. And uh, and it kind of ties to last week's being thankful. Okay, there we go. All right, there we go. Uh, but I believe that God loved Himself so mu- uh, loved, loved words so much that He called Himself the Word, and we find that in John one verse one it says, "In the beginning, before all time, was the Word Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself." Uh, I heard somebody say that one time, and uh, and uh, it really struck home to me because God had been dealing with me about the words that come out of our mouths. And, uh, and how that they can create, how can they can create life or they can actually create death. Uh, I shared last week how we use our words to, uh, to enter certain environments. I shared how that uh, in Psalms 104, uh, verse 4, that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and uh, into his courts with praise. That uses our words. I believe we can also exit certain environments from the words that we choose to use. Uh, there's a story that years ago I, w- I had the opportunity to do some uh, Best Buys for this company called T.D. Farrell, and at this point in my life I had done six of them, and I had gotten very good, very fast at accomplishing these Best Buys. I, they, they each, I'll share a little financial information with you just to give God the glory, but each of them paid about $50,000 right on the nose, and I got to where I could do them in two weeks at a time. So I was making money. I had, I had already done six. I was on number seven and number eight. And as I completed it, if you do the math, eight times 50 is $400,000 that I had already stood to make from this company. And on the seventh and eighth job, uh, we had some extra work that needed to be done. And, and the contractor that was scheduled to do it didn't do it. So we stepped up. We bought the materials. We bought the supplies. We did the extra work. It wasn't that much, but the, but the material bill was about $4,000. Not very much in the comparison to 400000 But in my little simple thinking mind, uh, they had a conflict of paying me. Basically, the reason they weren't paying me is because I hadn't done my own homework. You see, I was supposed to have presented what's called a change order, uh, change of price, basically. And I was supposed to have gotten it approved prior to doing the work. And I didn't. I didn't do my homework, you see. So because I didn't do my homework, I wasn't entitled to get paid. But I fussed, regardless of knowing that I didn't do my own homework, to the point that I told them to lose my number with my words. I used my words to say, lose my phone number and don't call me again. Guess what happened? They lost my phone number and they didn't call me again. So my little old mouth, not thinking that my words had the power to create life or death, ruined, I I destroyed, I created the death of a relationship. 
to this day, T.D. Farrell and me are not in relationship. I missed out on an opportunity because of words that I use. So I believe your words can also cause you to exit an environment. I believe that very strongly. I believe you should be careful. This is a wisdom key. What words you allow to come out of your mouth. You should be protective of the, of the words coming out of your mouth as if you were looking at a thief coming in your house because it is so deadly and so dangerous and so powerful. How many knows that God is powerful? If God called his self the word, how many knows words are also powerful? Very powerful. Amen. As Christians, there should be a, there should be a noticeable difference of what comes in and out, uh, comes out of our mouth. In James 3.10, it says, Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring, uh, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? From our mouth should not be blessings and cursings. Amen. Amen. The words that we use, if you're taking notes, the first note is the words we use matter, number one. Number two, the words we do not use also matters, number two. I believe that the right words can protect you and the wrong words can destroy you. I just shared about how they, that I, almost, I destroyed a relationship. Proverbs 18, 21 says that words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit and you get to choose. See, the benefit of this old mouth of ours is we get to choose what comes out. We get to choose what comes out. Amen. Uh, uh, there was a Bible story about a guy who uh, was, a prophet had went to give him a message that he was about to die. And, uh, and so when he received the message, he said, oh, dear Lord, I, I don't want to die yet. I want to praise you. And, and immediately used his words to begin to praise God. And before the prophet got far down the road, God told the prophet to turn around and go back and tell the guy because of his words of praise that God was going to give him another 15 years. Amen. How many knows that our words can create life or death? Amen. 15 more years for praising God. That'll make you want to get up and praise God. Amen. Amen. Death and life lie in the tongue. I've got another story. This is one of my favorite. And it... it really puts a price tag on words you see God uh, in my life for me I relate to money I relate to business kind of a things and and so I use a lot of business stories well this is another one and it was one of the first times that God really put a price tag on words that first one didn't really dawn on me this one really dawned on me you see I was in doing a Walmart and they had asked me to to lay tile in an area that I knew could not be done without some major issues so we went to this meeting, meeting with all these corporate folks around this table at a Walmart, and the, the general contractor was there with me, and he was a guy that liked to use foul language. And so we were sitting there, and, and the meeting got done, and at the end there was still no resolution on what it was I should do. And uh, I looked at Adam, that was his name, the superintendent, and said, what should we do? And Adam chose to use a cuss word, the most simple cuss word that I could choose out of the dictionary of cuss words. It's the little, the little simple one, the innocent one, the S-H-I-T. You see, if I was going to choose a cuss word that in my mind would be very least offensive, it'd be the D-A-M or the S-H-I-T. And this guy particularly chose the S-H-I-T and said, at the end of the conversation, I said, what should I do? He said, I don't know. It doesn't seem like anybody here wants to be responsible for S-H-I-T. Very simple, very simple phrase. The only cuss word in the whole conversation. And when I went home, we're night shift, of course, went home and I slept all day. And when I woke up, I called Adam to see what we were doing that night find out my instruction and Adam said I don't know what to tell you I'm not on that job anymore I said you're not on that job what happened he said I got fired today you were the one cussed him out at first I said oh me dear Lord thank God that how'd that get corrected he said yeah had it not been for me speaking up in your defense and saying you know what that's not true because I have never heard Caleb Gooden say a single cuss word at this time in my life, I promise you, I had not been praying God correct my tongue. I had not even been thinking about it. I had simply been seeking God's face. And by the grace of God, he had must have already at least kept my mouth from being heard if it still was not delivered. Had kept me from saying a cuss word in the presence of Adam. I had evidently not said a cuss word in a joke to make him laugh. I had evidently not said a cuss word when I hit my hammer with the finger. Out of just... Popping out of your mouth sometimes, how it does. 
I, I, yeah, I had, I had not done anything that would have created me evidently to say a cuss word in this guy's presence. And thank God I had not. Because I shared how God had first put a price tag on my words. This particular job, I'm going to share some finances with you this morning. Only to give God the glory, not, not to give Caleb good to make you think I'm rich. But that contract was $252,000. It was $2,000 more than a quarter of a million. You only do that four times, you got a million bucks. I was 2000 past the quarter of a million mark. Had I been the one who had said a cuss word on accident, slipped up on a, in a joke or whatever, guess what? Adam would not have been able to say what he said in my defense, and I would have been the one who lost his job. There was nobody else that worked for me at that time that could have took the reins and finished that job. I was the only one. I had nobody else to take over. We would have lost $252,000 over what would have been considered the most simple cuss word that you could have chosen out of the cuss word dictionary. You think words don't matter? You think words don't have a value? They have a serious value. God loved words so much he called the word. And if you can't put a price tag on it in monetary, there's a lot of other things I can tell you how you can understand the cost of words. Amen. As Christians, people should hear something different coming out of our, out of our mouth. The words we do not use, just as well as the words that we do use, also matter. Amen. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. See, our words are supposed to edify. They're supposed to lift up. They're supposed to heal. That it may impart grace. They're supposed to deliver grace to the hearers. And, not, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. This is Charles Stanley's and the whole Bible uh, Baptist organization, I believe, kind of wraps their self around this. And it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You see, the Holy Spirit's placed a seal on you. We should live up to that seal. Amen. Amen. And let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Words are so important. There should not be the things coming out of our mouth as Christians as happens with non-Christians. <clears throat> Amen. You may say, Caleb, I'm not at the same level as you. And, uh, and you know, that 250000 Buck story. I don't have none of them. Matter of fact, I can go cuss my boss out because it's not so valuable to me. Well, I can tell you in Matthew 25, 23, it says that we have to be faithful over a few things before God can make us ruler over many things. If you don't start right now with where you are, I don't care if you're working at the tasty treat, by understanding the value of words, you're going to be in trouble. Amen. And I know words are hard to get a tame on. There, there are some scriptures that says it's, harder, it's easier to tame a lion than it is to tame the tongue. I understand that. Matter of fact, I remind myself of a joke of a, of a preacher who had this bicycle and he really didn't need it. And he seen this young man walking up the street with a lawnmower. And, and he needed that lawnmower. And, and so he hollered out to the guy, hey, what are you going to do with that lawnmower? He said, ah, I'm pushing it home for junk. He said, uh, he said, does it run? He said, yeah. He said, uh, well, I'd trade you this bicycle for that lawnmower. And so sure enough, they did. And the preacher got out, gotten ready to cut the grass. And he pulled the lawnmower and wouldn't crank and wouldn't crank. And finally, he seen the kid again. He said, man, I thought you said that lawnmower worked. He said, it does, but you got to cuss it. He said, what? He said, yep, you got to cuss that thing a few times and it'll fire up. He said, man, I'm a preacher. It's been so long since I've used those kind of foul language and those kind of cuss words. I don't even remember how to cuss anymore. I don't even remember any cuss words. He said, you keep pulling it, it'll come back to you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I believe that it's tough to get a grip on our words. Amen. Amen. Unnecessary words can cost you. Unnecessary words can cost you, note number three. My brother's got a story of, of him giving a presentation, and, you know, he's in the computer industry, and he deals with some very high-end clientele, and, and that he was riding with a guy to do the presentation. And at the end of the speech, it was a time when, when we were talking, our, our whole country was talking about uh, discovering the idea of drilling uh, old wells offshore of our Gulf Coast and Mississippi, Louisiana area, and, and uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, he had done great, but something was mentioned about that, and, and he spoke up and said, yeah, if we could get some of those truck, uh, tree huggers out of the way, we could get more uh, self-reliant on our resources, and America could quit being dependent on other countries, and we could get this problem fixed. 
But he called out the word tree huggers. You see, tree huggers describe a, a, a category of folks who want to protect their, our environment. What he didn't know was that some of his biggest money players on the front row were what you would have called a tree hugger. They love to ride their bicycles in the national forest. They love to protect the wildlife. They love to do all things. And, and on the way, my brother uh, was riding with his guests there, and he said, how did I do? He said, man, you did great. Man, you discussed how the computer backup information system that we've got is so valuable and how they need it. And, man, you just rolled through the points of why they need to sell it. But at the very end, I'm not sure that you didn't cancel out every good thing you said. He said, what are you talking about? He said, when you mention tree huggers, he said, I don't know if you realize it, but that's who it is you're selling to. And he said, I don't know that your unnecessary words didn't just cost you our whole trip. Unnecessary words can cost you. Scripture says we can say too much. In Proverbs 17, 28, it says that even dunces, stupid folks, who keep quiet are thought to be wise as long as they keep their mouth shut you might assume they're smart. That's what Scripture says. So if you've got a question of your intelligence, just stay smart. I, I stay quiet. People will think you're smart. Amen? Uh, people will think you're, you're, you're smart if you'll shut up. You know, our last president, he really needed to have exercised this Scripture, and our current president, I believe, won the election off of that one. Amen? We should have kept quiet. Amen? Proverbs ten nineteen says that in a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Note number four, how you say your words can protect you. You see, I don't believe just the words that you use. I believe how you say the words that you use are so critical. Scripture says in Proverbs 15, 1, that a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. How many has ever tried to, to whoop a dog that just laid down? The fight's out of you. You don't want to whoop him anymore. He just lays down. Well, I can tell you, I love Mikey Hatfield so much, and, and he's a guy that poor guy, angels have protected him all his life. It's the only reason he's still alive. But he gets himself in some fixes. But every now and then, he'll have a little accident, and I'll ask Mikey, hey, what happened? Did you do that? He'll say, you know, I don't know. I may have. I can't be sure if I did. I, I don't know for sure if I did. I'm sorry, thank, uh, uh, but I can't be sure if I did. He, he'll answer whether he's, he's guilty or not guilty, but he puts it out there in a way that I can't. Get on to the crazy cat no more. He's done admitted that he's done something. He don't know what he's done, but he's done something. <coughs> he ain't going to deny it. But see, I believe that, that how we respond to words, our reaction to words, really will, will create a fight, will heal a relationship, will fix a lot of things, just how we respond. But a soft answer in particular, if somebody comes at you hollering and you just say, yes, sir, I'm sorry, in a in a tone that is very quiet. Don't raise your tone. Scripture says, I didn't say, it'll, it'll, it'll cease a fight from even starting. It'll turn away wrath. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I had another story where, well, I won't, I, I'll say it. Another story where a guy that worked for me was getting in uh, a situation where they thought he had said a word. And, the, and I was in that same communication meeting I just shared with you. We have it every morning at 7.30. And somebody busts in the door and says, such and such out there just cussed out a customer. And I said, oh, Lord, who? They said, one of your guys. I said, oh, no, man. I was, I was, my heart's dropping. And somebody else in the room spoke up and said, Caleb's guys? I said, I, Caleb don't cuss. His, he don't tolerate that. His, his whole uh, system of guys, I, I just cannot I find that hard to believe. Because the guys at Caleb Works are different. They're different. You see, my guys kept their mouth shut at least when they're in my presence or at least knew that I was a guy that, that tried to represent God and at least they honored me enough that they too had watched their mouths and evidently we had gotten a relationship that one of the guys in the meeting, they were ready to fire this guy and kick him out. One of the guys in the meeting said, no, 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 nothing. we're not doing anything. So what do you want to do? He said, we're not doing anything until I investigate this. This don't sound right. You see, I believe your words and words that you use and don't use can protect not only you, but those people around you. Those people around you can be protective when you use or don't use the right words. Amen? Amen. Uh, 
Note number four, how you say your words can protect you. No, this is four and a half. I started adding some other stuff. Four and a half, when you say your words matter. Uh, I had ten, but I had to do some halves in here. But four and a half is when you say your words matter. Proverbs 27, 14 says it this way, that he who blesses his friend with a loud voice. See, it starts off he's going to, he intends to bless his friend, but he used a loud voice, but he used it at the wrong time. Rising early in the morning, it was counted, it will be counted to him, uh, accounted a curse to him. You see, we can use the right words at the wrong time, and they can be considered a curse. Your friend wants to hear you say, bless you, but not at 5 o'clock in the morning. Don't come to my house hollering to me, bless you, Caleb, at 5 o'clock in the morning when I'm not awake yet. I mean, how many knows the, the, the when you say your words matter? Amen. How you write your words matter. Now, we live in a social uh, era where, social group era, where everybody's quick to not just say, but to write their words. So I want to talk about writing your words. If the kids were in here, I'd love for them to hear this. But I share with my guys how that your handwriting what can create life and death. And I tell the story of how I do, uh, I go get my glasses at a place in Carrollton called Pearl Center Vision. And, and it just so happened we had an opportunity to do the floor there. And, and as we got into doing the floor, I began to, to make friends with the doctor. And we began to talk. And I said, hey, uh, you know, how much cheaper was I than the next guy on the, on the totem pole when it comes to bidding the contractor, uh, the contract, you see? Because in my game, I have to be the cheapest price to get the job. Don't say a lot about me. I'm the cheapest guy out there sometimes. But... But this particular case, uh, I wanted to know how bad cheaper, how much cheaper I was than the next guy on the list. And uh, he said, oh, Caleb, you wasn't cheaper. I said, well, that don't make sense. That's usually the only reason I get the job is I'm the cheapest. He said, oh, no, no, you is by far not the cheapest. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, you might have been the highest. I said, why would you give me the job? He said, because when you handed me your presentation, your proposal for the work to be completed, he said, your proposal was in a nice, neat, orderly fashion, printed out, took time to be put together. The other guys that I received quotes from all were handwritten and sloppy and half I couldn't even read or understand and it didn't describe what they were doing, what, they were, what I was buying. He said, in just your presentation, the way you wrote your words, even though you were the highest price, you say, I believe your words and your way you write your words can actually create value. It did for me. It did for me, amen. I was by far. Matter of fact, let me tell you this little short part. In this particular job, I had made a mistake. I had quoted a 1,000 square feet too much. Wasn't even on the job. Way, the job, I think, was only 1,500 feet, so I had almost doubled the size of that job, and I still won the job. I was not just a little high. I was almost twice as high as I should have been according to my own standards. And I still got the job. Extra money can be created by the words that you use, how you say them, when you say them, and how you write them. Amen. But it's so important that in, in the world that we live in today with our Facebook and our Twitter and our social media, how that we need to be careful with the words that we use. Uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, you're supporting the Black Lives Matter or the White Lives Matter or the, or the oil drilling uh, tree huggers, whatever it is you are saying, be careful not to limit yourself. I can appreciate Black Lives Matter. I can appreciate White Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. I can appreciate all those movements. I believe they are needed to change our system. But be careful how you respond and, and how you reply on Facebook and social media because sometimes if people take the words that you say wrong, they can literally limit whatever else that you say that they might have listened to. You see, I believe you got to like your teacher to hear his instruction and to learn from him. And if you start discrediting somebody because of a political belief that you wrote, all of a sudden you've limited your ability to be a witness. And I, I was asking my father, I believe it was Billy Graham and President Nixon. Uh, but, but Billy Graham had spoke up in support of President Nixon during the campaign. And, and, and my, the way I understand it, his uh, uh, approval of Nixon was sort of the reason why Nixon got elected presidency. But we all know the story of Watergate and how Nixon made a mistake. And supposedly Billy Graham lived with regrets the rest of his life because he felt like he had put a guy up that was to lead our country, that made a mistake. And he himself said it haunted him for the rest of his life. I believe we have to be careful 
with the words that we use, even especially in politics. I believe we're supposed to stand up and not be quiet in certain times, but sometimes we need to be quiet. Amen. Be careful what you write on Facebook. Even the, even the vaccination conspiracy theories. Don't jump on those bandwagons. You can limit yourself. If, you don't, if you're a, a, a pro, a, opposed to the vaccination, keep your mouth shut. If you're for it, keep your mouth shut sometimes, in my opinion, if it becomes pol political to the point that it could limit who it is you're able to mi uh, minister to. Amen. But we have a mission. We need to make necessary adjustments to accomplish our mission. Amen. If you want to be, uh, if you want to be viewed on Facebook as perfect, and all of us do, because that's that's where we put our best our best face on. We we put our best post and and photos on. I'll tell you how to be perfect. Uh, in James three two, it says, "For we all stumble in many things, but if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. He's able to bridle the whole body when he bridles his tongue." Amen. Number seven, the words we can, the words we use can change the course of our lives. James 3 verse 4 says, look at, all, look at the ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest uh, see how great a forest a little fire kindles. Uh, I believe, the scripture says that our tongue literally controls our ship. I believe our words can control the course of our lives. As we sang this morning, Sister Michelle said, we trust in God. I believe when we begin to say that, something inside of us begins to believe that. And when we exercise that, we got it figured out. All we got to do is trust and rely on Him. Amen? Amen. The words that we say, the words that we believe matter. I believe this is a wisdom key. I, I wrote outward words expose our inner beliefs. And I love to, to, to tell this story. Jesus said it twice, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh uh, the, in two different times, one Luke 6, 45, and another in Matthew. But it says, out of the abundance, abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What, come, what goes in must come out. Amen. Uh, and, uh, and so <clears throat> the key is to change uh, our hearts and our minds, but I usually tell this story about attitude and, and how that it can change your life. You see, I believe if you had two guys up here on the stage, and one really believed inside that, that he could get a friend to help him with $20, and the other didn't believe so much that his friend may help him with $20, and they went up to their friend, it would be exposed in how they approached their friend to borrow that $20. The first guy who believed his friend would give him that $20 might come up to his friend, something of this nature, and say, hey, good old buddy, old pal. I know you got some money, and I know you would help out a friend like me if I needed some money. And at this point, I need $20, and I know you're going to help me with that, right? You see, that guy that believed his friend would help him has almost set up his friend to say yes. If he says no, it's completely different from, from anything that would have normally took place because he's geared up to say yes. Probably, without a doubt, this old fellow would probably get us $20 because he didn't have any doubt. Now, the second friend who, who uh, needed the $20, who really didn't believe that he had, uh, could get $20, may approach his friend of this nature. Hey, old buddy, I know you ain't got $20 on you, do you? I, I, I know you probably wouldn't loan me $20, would you? See, he goes into it setting the friend up to say, no, nope, matter of fact, I don't have $20. No, nope, matter of fact, I won't give you any. He set him up to make it an easy answer of no. You say, I believe what's in our heart. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaketh. And if you believe that you're going to get favor, you'll get favor. If you don't believe you're going to get favor, the words coming out of your mouth will almost create a roadblock to where you will not get the favor that God has designed for you to receive. Amen? We must change what is in our hearts in order for it to change our minds, in order for it to change our, our words coming out of our mouth. Amen? What comes out of your mouth can change the course of your lives. Number eight, the words we listen to can change our lives. You know, there's a rule of life that, that people say, what goes up must come down. Uh, well, I believe what goes in must come out. And I believe that if we focus on what goes in, we don't have to worry about so much about what comes out. Yeah, I know for me personally, if you put me in a room, in a bar room, where everybody's saying the cuss words full blown it won't be but a minute i'll be by myself hit my finger and be like oh probably be boop boop and i'll be like how'd that happen 
And I can look back and say, you know what? I was exposed to what was going into me. And if I could have stopped that, I could have controlled more about what was coming out of me. What goes up must come down. What goes in must come out. If we'll focus on what goes in more, we won't have to worry about what comes out so much. You see, I believe that time in my life when I told you that I had quit saying cuss words was probably because I had already been learning that I need to be careful about what I was putting in. I, at that time, I was probably only listening to, and I still do try to only listen to things that are encouraging, things that are uplifting. Even the music, man, I cannot. When I, when I changed my life, I can't even listen to the old, I used to like rap music. Y'all, y'all don't criticize me, old white boy in a country town. But I used to sing some crazy rap music that was so death, self-destructing. That, man, I had to really change it up. Now, as much as I love rap, I was sharing with Denise and, and, and Greg yesterday how I was teaching Isaac how to bebop. I love that stuff. It's fun to me. But I can't listen to it anymore because it takes me back to that old way of thinking. You've got to change some things when you have a, when you have a uh, uh, change of heart. Amen. The first time I soloed my airplane, there was a realization that I was the one who must land? I took off. Everything was good. I got up in the air, and all of a sudden, this sense of realization that said, hey, if it's to be, it's up to me. I have, for the first time, got to land this plane, and there ain't nobody in here except me. Buddy, when I realized what came up, what went up, had to come down, there was some fear of God in me. I can, under, I can help you know that what, that what comes up must come down is a scary moment for me. Amen. But you got to you got to keep your mind realizing that what goes up must come down. What goes in has got to come out. Your, your faith, here's you another wisdom key. Your mind and your faith respond to anything that you say. And so you should be careful to never verbalize anything that you don't really want to happen. Never verbalize anything that you really don't want to happen. Because if you say it long enough... It'll get down in your spirit. It'll take root, and eventually you'll believe it. You know, we, we have a, the problem with lying. This is the problem with lying I want to tell you about right here. Telling a story that's not true is that you first hear the lie, and you, and you train yourself to believe it because when you tell a lie long enough, you heard you, you, you're the saying that you'll start to believe it. I believe it's true is that something subconsciously begins to believe that, that you're lying, and ultimately it'll understand that you are a liar, and that what you say is not true. And so when the point comes to when you want to say, I am healed. I am delivered. I am set free. I am an overcomer. I am all the things that I'm supposed to be. Guess what? Who don't believe you? Your own self. Because you've been lying and teaching yourself that what you say may or may not be true. Be careful telling a lie. Because you can, you can abort your ability to change things in your life with your words. They have no more power. Scripture talks about salt and how that salt will get saturated and becomes useless and flavorless. Don't lose your flavor, amen. And I believe that faith is the currency for heaven. I love the little children's book, the little choo-choo train. I can't remember, but he says, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Little engine that could. Let me tell you, that little choo-choo train understood that if he said it long enough, it'd get down in the spirit, and he would believe it, and he would be able to pull that heel. I think I can. I think I can. We need to get that understanding that faith is the currency for, for, for heaven, for all of heaven. Pastor Dylan's not here, but he shared a message how that our words dispatch angels on our behalf. Our words are so powerful. Amen. All right. So I just shared number eight, eight. Number eight was the words we listen to can change our lives. Here's eight and a half. I told you I had to throw some in. How we listen and respond to words that uh, says what we are or who we are. I'll say it again because I got tied up. How we listen, how we respond to the words uh, says a lot about who we are and even what we are. You see, Proverbs 15 verse 5 says, Only a, only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise. What that says is, is that your reaction when somebody's correcting you or trying to teach you or, or showing you a better way, if you don't receive that very well, you might be a fool. If you'll listen to it and take heed to it and use what you can and leave the rest, some things you can't always use from a uh, recommendation from a friend, but take what you can use and leave the rest was our old saying. 
but how you listen, how you react says whether or not you're wise or you're a fool. You see, fools don't like to listen. They don't like to be corrected. And, and here's another thing. Sometimes fools like to talk before they actually listen. In Proverbs 18, 13, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. And I share, I used to tease with, about Mikey and Daddy would have been great Jeopardy players because they're ready to hit the button sometimes before the question's even read. You know, that's great on Jeopardy, but it's not good according to Scripture that you might be a fool if you're quick to speak before you listen. Might be some fools on Jeopardy. Amen. Lord, forgive me. I love Jeopardy. Number nine, whose words we listen to can limit our destiny. I, I was trying to think of the song, but the little country singer that shares his little boys in the back seat, and they get to a red light, and he spills his French fries, and he says a bloop word, and his daddy says, who, where'd you hear that? He said, daddy, I heard it from you. I want to be just like you. Man, that hits home with me because whether you know it or not, you little ones are watching you. Amen. Or maybe the Christmas story where the little boy is changing his daddy's lug nuts and he's got the lug nuts in the hubcap and they go flying and he says a blankety blank. I love that one because mama goes home and calls his friend and said, where'd you hear those words? He said, well, daddy says that. He said, your daddy is, no, 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 your son. But really anyway, uh, it was the daddy he had heard it from. Amen. But, but listen, what goes in must come out. I can't say that enough. What you hear your daddy say, it going to come out. Amen. So listen to your father up there, and it'll come out also. Amen. Uh, Romans ten seventeen says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I believe that, again, faith is the currency of heaven, and if you'll get it inside of you by listening to it, by coming to church like you are, keeping your, your radio station on things that are encouraging and uplifting, reading your word, talking to others about God, there's a whole lot of ways that you can hear the word. Amen. But I want to share another situation where the words of, of people that we listen to can limit our destiny. You see, when we read in the, in the book of Numbers, how the, the Israelites had came up to the promised land, and they were getting ready to take over this promised land. There was big giants in the land, and uh, there was, back up a little bit, there was grapes so big it took two men to, to carry a cluster of them. And, and the scripture says that there was milk and honey that was flowing and, and was abundant. And this land was great land. It was a promised land. And so when they get there, they send out these 12 spies, and, and, and out of the 12, 10 comes back to them and says, there's a lot of giants in that land. I'm not sure that we can take that land because those are some big dudes. Now, you've got to remember, these are the same Israelites that had experienced the Red Sea splitting. They had experienced so many, their shoes not wearing out for 40 years, manna falling from heaven daily, and all of a sudden, all the things that, that God has should have proven to them based on their past that their future should be okay had went in one ear and out the other evidently and all of a sudden 10 of the spies said we can't do it there's giants we'll be defeated two of them were were really untouched with God Caleb and Joshua I'm proud to carry Caleb's name but they said no are you kidding man the God that's on our side we can take this land we can kill those giants there's 40,000 of us and ever how many of them and we can do this, you know, based on our past, our history, uh, based on our history, our future should be okay. But see, the Israelites chose to believe the 10 who said, no, we cannot. They didn't choose to believe the two with the positive report. You see, the words of who we listen to can affect our destiny. Because they listened to the, to the ones that were giant conscious versus God conscious, it limited their destiny. It limited their ability to enter, to access an environment that was designed for them to enter. Amen? We cannot become giant conscious. We have to remain God conscious. Don't believe the negative report. You can't have a grasshopper mentality. You gotta have a giant God killing conscious, a, a, a God giant killing conscious. Amen. <clears throat> they never entered the land because of who they chose to believe. Be careful. Your mind and your faith respond to anything you allow others to say to you. Your words are so critical, so crucial. I shared how your attitude determines your altitude. Basically, your attitude will determine how far you go. Our conversations will reveal whether we see ourselves as a winner or a loser. At what we speak, at the things that come out of our mouth, people will size you up and say, that guy's a winner and that guy's a loser. We can tell when we just listen to others, but somehow we don't listen ourselves and determine that. Amen. Losers focus on their problems. Winners focus on their possibilities. 
How do we change the words that we allow in our lives? How do we change what kind of words we allow in our conversation? How do we control our tongue, you may ask, because that's a hard one. I already said that, that uh, it's easier to, to tame a lion than it is your, your tongue. Matter of fact, I've got some even some worse news. In James 3, 8, it says, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That's a sad little scripture, but let me tell you one that's got some hope to it. <clears throat> let me tell you how to fix it. You see, only God can help you tame your tongue and help you change your words. In Isaiah 57, verse 19, it says, Peace, peace to him, as far, to him who is far off, both Jew and Gentile, and to, who, to him who is near, says the Lord, because I will create the fruit of your lips, and I will heal him. I will make his lips blossom anew. With speech in thankful praise. I shared about Thanksgiving and being thankful last week. Here God is saying that he is going to create reasons to be thankful on your lips if you allow him. Amen. My story, I didn't even have to focus on what was coming out of my mouth as long as I focused on what, was I, what I was allowing on the inside of me. You see, we have been instructed, we've been anointed, we've been qualified to speak and preach the gospel to the meek and the poor and the afflicted, to bind up and to heal and to proclaim liberty and, and freedom to captives, it says in Isaiah 61. It says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. You see, we've got a mission. We've got an assignment to use our words to benefit the kingdom of God, to represent the kingdom of God. I believe we represent Christ almost like amb ambassadors to our country. And we have to choose the words that come out of our mouth. Our words should have a mission, should have a mission to heal, should have a mission to set free, should have a mission to create, not destroy, should even have a mission to slow time if necessary. You see, I remember another scripture in the Bible where a fellow was, was fighting a war and he needed more time to win the war. And he literally prayed that God would stop the sun. And God did stop the sun long enough for him to win the war. Amen. God has created us the ability, the power of our tongues just to ask. We have not because we ask not. Just to ask for things to be done. And it can be done. Last night I had just a few hours of sleep and I asked. God, to give me supernatural rest. I feel great this morning. I was looking at my prayer notes as I was studying last night and the things I was praying for back in 2017, when, actually when we were in Miami, Richard, and some of the things that we were praying for was one was an airplane, was two was a campground. Was There was a whole list of things me and you were praying for, and I was like, Man, God has checked off every one of those. It was the words that I used. I had not because I asked not. And when I began to ask, I began to receive. I've got a lot of things on my prayer list because I chose to use words, the right words that created blessings. And when I began to ask for it, I began to create an expectation of faith. And I told you that faith is a belief system. Fear is also a belief system. We're believing for something positive with faith. We're scared to death of something that's going to happen when we're afraid. But both are believing for something. Amen. Choose to believe for the faith part of it. Amen. Change your lives. Change lives starting with your own. Amen. You can ask God for anything. Amen. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul, to the soul and health to the bones. Our words should be sweet. They should be different. Amen. I'm going to stop it right now. I could go on and on and on. Words, man, God has gave me such a, a message about words that I, I could write a book, maybe many books on it, because it's so powerful to me. It's so real to me because God has personally showed me just how I can change my life with what comes out of my tongue. Amen. If you believe it, amen. Say amen. This morning, let's close our eyes and pray. Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you for this word that you've given me today, Lord Jesus. I ask that, that uh, the times that we have came up short, Father, that you would, you would forgive us. The times that we use the wrong words, Father, that you would forgive us. Father, when we have limited our access to you, Father, help us to believe the words that you have spoken throughout Scripture, Lord Jesus. Father, help us to not discourage others, Father, but to encourage others with the words that we speak. Father, let us have godly ideas and godly words that are continually on our lips. Father, have an attitude of gratitude. Father, Lord, that we may enter into your courts with thanksgiving, uh, gates with thanksgiving and courts with praise. Father, let praise be like a river that is flowing across our lips. 
to be like a sweet honeycomb, Father. Let us to be healers to others, Father. Let us to, to unlock locked doors, Father, and to not kill opportunities with wrong words. Father, and we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed the word. Father, I just thank you and I praise you. Go ahead and play the music if you will. If you don't know Jesus today as, as your Lord and Savior, please don't wait any longer. The biggest trick of the enemy is to tell you that you've got more time, that you can do it anytime you want to. Today's the day of salvation. Nobody has promised tomorrow. You can accept Christ today and, and, and immediately have access to an environment called heaven, an environment of blessings, simply by asking. We have not because we ask not. Don't let today go by without asking God into your life. Amen. Amen. Romans 10, 9 says, If you openly, de openly declare Jesus as, as your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. It's that easy. It's just a belief system. It's just I want to factor. It's not get it right factor. You probably won't ever get it right. Matter of fact, if you do, I'm afraid you'll get some pride. That'll be where you got it wrong. But let your words be heard, the right words be heard, <clears throat> and the w wrong words not. But, but believe. Learn to, to, even if you don't believe. I, I heard a scripture of a guy that said, Lord, I want to believe, but hit me with my disbelief. You're still going to have that. You're still going to have that. Amen. Come on, Papa. I just want to add a little something here. I, I was reading before you, even the service started today, so I think it sort of blends in what you're saying. Uh, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, Amen. nor standeth in the ways of sinners. Now, I want to back up for a minute and read that same verse from the Message Bible. And it says this way, How well God must like you. You don't hang out at sins alone. You don't sink along dead end roads. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. <laughs> I thought, well, that's great. I know some people didn't hear that. Then he says, uh, uh, "You walk not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standing in the ways of the sinner, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. But his light is in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate day and night." Now let me go. Let me go. Switch over to Message Bible to read it from there. It says, uh, instead you thrill to you're, you're thrilled to God's word. You chew on the scripture day and night. Your tree is replanted in Eden, bringing fresh fruit every month. Never dropping a leaf, always blossoming. Let's go back to King James for a second, see what it says. All right, he says, okay, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The, that bringeth forth his fruit in season, and his leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Hear that? It's conditional, but he gives you a, a conditional promise. What you put in, come out. Watch this now. He said, you're not like the wicked. You, were, you, you are where mere wind-blown dust, without defense in the court, unfit company for in... Uh, innocent people God charts the road you take the road that you take is skid row he's talking about the unrighteous there let's go back here to King James and read that he says uh, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knoweth the ways of the righteous but the ways of the ungodly shall perish hey that's something did you say that's a good word good message this morning Hallelujah. Give God a big hand for that. Amen. Amen and amen. That's a really good word. Brother Rusty, would you come and uh, lead us into the, uh, do a, call, a couple of songs or something. Give me a chance to change over. And we're going we're gonna to have a baptism this morning. Hold on to us for a minute. Jesus.